so this is uh, this is a talk that uh, I actually gave this once years ago, an er a much earlier version of this uh, at this in this very room in this very over this very lunch. Uh, this is hopefully a new and improved version. It's the old one was based on one chapter of my thesis. This is based on two chapters of my thesis. So by my calculations, it's at least twice as good as the last talk. <laughs> Uh, and I'm hoping to give this at, uh, so I submitted this as an abstract to the Canadian Philosophy Association conference in Montreal in July. So with any luck, I'll be giving this in Montreal. So without further ado, scientific laws, models, and explanations. So <clears throat> the basic question here is, what are the content of scientific theories? Uh, and we're trying to distinguish particular facts uncovered from science from the more general theoretical aspects of knowledge, right? So what are the a theory presumably is the more general bit of scientific knowledge. Uh, and I take it that theories are supposed to have something to do with explanation. So if you have a theory, you don't just know some facts, you understand the system in some important way and can explain it in some important way. So I take it those are fairly uncontroversial assumptions in this crowd. Uh, it's worth saying off the bat, <clears throat> mostly for the historians in the room, that what I'm going to be doing is what philosophers call an explication. That is, we're trying to maximize the following things. So fit with common usage. Historians should appreciate that one at least. Uh, but internal coherence as well. Uh, rational justification. So we're trying to come up with a, an account of the content of scientific theories that's rationally justifiable. And stuff like other epistemic goods like simplicity, that kind of thing. So I'm trying to come up with an account of the content of scientific theories that uh, captures most of what we usually mean by words like law and model. Uh, but I'm not strictly tied to that as a project. So if my usage diverges from common usage at least a little, I'm OK with that so long as it satisfies some of these other things that we might want. So it's a, it's a kind of mixed normative descriptive project. If that makes you uncomfortable, you're probably not a philosopher. Okay, so just <laughs> just heads up. You know, some, some people find this very disturbing. It's like that's not what people always and ev everywhere meant by this. So anyway, all right. So uh, just do a little bit of history before I get into the sort of positive view. Uh, the so mostly what I'm going to talk about are laws and models, and then I'm going to sort of describe how my picture of laws and models fits in with what we want from explanations. Just as a as a quick quick preview, what I'm basically going to say is laws tend to rule things out and models tend to rule things in. So I'm proposing a kind of division of labor between laws and models. And when you have both of those things, you have a theory which you can use to explain things. So that's the really slogan-y version of this. So I'm going to do a little bit of history to motivate this from the things philosophers have said about this. So the kind of mid 20th century positivist view of laws was that there's something like universal generalizations. So for all x, if x is an f, then g is an x, or sorry, x is a g. So if it has one pro for all things, if it has this property, it has that property. And they meant things like all metals expand when heated, or all objects attract each other gravitationally. And they, of course, used their absolute favorite formalism, which was modern symbolic logic, because they thought that was going to solve literally all of our philosophical problems. Not so much, but you know, it was worth a shot. Uh, this is associated with a view of how you explain things called the deductive nomological account. So you ask yourself, here's an explanatory request. Why does the Earth orbit the sun? And then you give some universal law and then some initial conditions. So you say, all, here's the universal law. All objects attract each other gravitationally. And then you plug some facts into that abstract law. The Earth and sun are objects. Therefore, the Earth and sun attract each other gravitationally. We have explained why the Earth orbits the sun, according to this model. Uh, so that should strike you as awkward and not really how scientists ever talk at all, right? Um, so very little of scientists. Some of the problems for this view were when we got into the, you know, Kuhn came along and philosophers of science started actually caring about scientific practice. Turns out that like very, very little of scientific practice has that clunky deductive nomological form, right? Uh, very few univer truly universal generalizations. There's some in fundamental physics, but after that, you usually get generalizations that are less than universal. And scientific explanations practically never look deductively valid. Like, we don't deduce things when we explain them, almost always. Uh, and to make them deductively valid, you have to add in uh, caterus paribus clauses, 
So like all objects expand when heated unless they're being hammered on from both ends or something like that. And you have to like have this almost infinite list of Caterus Paribus clauses to get deductions out of these things. So it's, this view did not hold up to serious scrutiny, especially scrutiny as to how it matched scientific practice. Uh, somewhere in the late 20th century, we shifted to the semantic view of theories, uh, which held that laws are mathematical, fundamentally mathematical, not propositional. So instead of universal generalizations represented in logic, we've got equations represented in math as the standard unit of scientific theories anyway. And these laws were understood as reducible to collections of models in a fairly specific sense of model. So uh, F equals MA is translatable into a series of specific values for F, M, and A, which satisfy the equality. So the models of that law are any way of filling in F, M, and A that satisfies that equality. Can we hold questions to the end, Paul? Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so that's a semantic view. A couple problems for the semantic view. Uh, when people say model, typically they don't just mean a way of filling out laws. Again, it's very poor, poor fit between this way of talking about laws and models and anything that scientists say ever. So uh, some models are like this, like data models, if you have, uh, but they're kind of the exception rather than the rule. So there's a few models that are just like ways of filling out equations, but usually we mean something more robust, right? We mean a kind of limited generalization or something like that. Like these models are hyper, hyper specific. They're one, ex exactly one way of filling out the equation, but usually you mean something that generalizes at least a little bit, uh, I would say. All right, so that's problems for the semantic view. Uh, at the very end of the 20th century, we get some advances in this project. Uh, I think uh, Morgan and Morrison's Models as Mediators project is a really important step along sort of characterizing laws and models in a way that actually captures how these words are used in science. So their claim is that uh, models are not reducible to the content of laws, right? Uh, that is, sometimes we have models before we have laws. Like we had models of superconductivity before we, I'm not even sure if we have laws of superconductivity yet. We have some models under which it happens. Can we hold questions to the end, Alan? Please, no, a, a, no, a, yeah, thank you. Yeah, let's, let's just hang on to the end, okay. Okay, so uh, you can build models of phenomena you don't fully understand, and sometimes, uh, s since there, you can have laws without being able to build models of them, that kind of thing. So there's this, they're building in this distance between laws and models, so you don't just reduce laws to models. You think of models as something that mediates between fully general law statements and specific statements about particulars. Uh, so these mo models have this kind of mediating in between role according to Morgan and Morrison. Uh, so they're neither a way of simply collecting data uh, since models building are building generalizations in a way that goes beyond what's strictly collect contained in the data. So when you, you draw a line through a bunch of data points you're not just summarizing the data points, you're actually going a bit beyond them. So you're generalizing a bit from just a collection of data. So this is the picture of Morgan and Morrison. I think this is almost completely right. And I'm basically just building on this suggestion, trying to add in my own kind of twist on it. So this models as mediator perspective actually opens up the question I'm trying to tackle here because previously we we're trying to reduce laws to models now we have a question of what the relationship is between laws and models, right? So we have two different things and we have to ask how are they related? And uh, Morrison gives the suggestion in her 2007 paper, Marty Morrison, uh, she argues that laws are more general and abstract than models. So we have a kind of continuous sort of scale on Mor Morrison's picture where you've got some concrete specific models and then very abstract high level general laws, and you just sort of like see a gradation between the two. So laws and models are related, in the, uh, according to Morrison, by being laws are more general and models are more specific. So I'm not sure that's exactly right, but my, my more serious worry about this is my thesis project. So my, my overall thesis project could be summed up in as what is generality anyway? Um, so 
I argue that we judge generality relative to a variety of different domains. So if you, ask, if you want to ask how general is this, first you have to answer what domain of generality are we talking about? What domain of possibilities are we talking about? So rather than there being a single univer universal metric of generality, there's a whole bunch of different metrics. And you have to find the relevant ones to say how general something is. And this, if you accept that, and I think you should see Lewis 2016 for more details, uh, that complicates the suggestion that laws are simply more general representations, full stop. So Morrison's suggestion is that the laws are just more general, but if there's not one single metric for generality, then it's not clear exactly what that means. So uh, just to fill in this notion of sort of domain relativity of generality a little bit. So relative to this domain of all physical possibilities, anything in the study of primates is going to be non-general, right? You're studying baboons and you make a generalization like baboon hierarchies are transitive. So if baboon A dominates B, B dominates C, then A dominates C. That's a generalization that they came up with in primatology. But in the space of physical possibilities, that occupies 0% of that space. 0%, an infinitesimal, and it's not literally, well, I guess it is literally zero. It's infinitesimal amount of that space. So, and furthermore, anything but the most fundamental of physical laws or models is going to occupy 0% of that space to an exceptionally good approximation. So that seems weird because primatologists are looking to generate what most people would consider generalizations, right? It's not, it's not that we should consider all sciences except fundamental physics to be completely non-general. Uh, so relativizing our assessments of generality to a domain makes this judgment make sense. So baboon dominance hierarchies are transitive relative to the space of baboon social dynamics. That's a general, a nice generalization about how baboons act. And then we can ask how, how general is this in primatology more generally or biology more generally. You don't get less and less general the bigger your domain is, but it's not zero anymore. It's not, you don't flatline and have these be like completely non-general. So that's the rough case for domain generality or domain relativity of generality. Okay. Oh, I got lots of time. So <clears throat> that's the proposal of generality. And now I'm going to sort of bring that back to interface it with the Morgan and Morrison stuff about laws and models. So this is my proposal. Uh, something is acting as a law when it rules out things from a domain. You say, in this domain, this never happens. And something is acting as a model when it rules something in, saying, in this domain, at least sometimes, this happens. Uh, and I'll argue right at the end that to have a satisfying explanation, you need to be able to do a little bit of both of those things. You, you have to be able to both rule things out and rule things in. Really, unlike the best explanations are like that. Maybe you can have some explanations that just do one, but really satisfying explanation, you should have at least the ability to say what, why what didn't happen didn't happen, and what did happen, why what did happen did happen. Whew, that was an awkward sentence. Okay. Okay, so that's the, that's the basic thing, and I've given you, given you the basic slogan, so let me go through some examples to show you how I think this works. So the Pauli exclusion principle is my favorite example of a law, a law that does nothing but rule things out. So the Pauli exclusion principle says no fer two fermions can be in the same quantum state in the same system at the same time. Never happens. It's never the case that two fermions are just occupying the exact same quantum state in the same system. That tells you nothing about what fermions do, what they positively do, right? It's, it's, it's explicitly and merely a prohibition against something happening. And I think this is a, like a pure example of what laws do. They tell you what never happens. I think this is a reasonable parsing of how we, how we understand law statements. Um, now that's a pure example. I'm not going to say that all things that we call laws only ever rule things out because I think these are two kind of epistemic roles that a given representation can play. So one equation or one statement can be a law or model depending on what job you're asking it to do. And some representations can do a little bit of both jobs. 
So these are epistemic rules, not categories of representations, but the Pauli exclusion principle is a representation that really only does one of those jobs. So it's a nice pure example of a law in my sense. Uh, equations can also act as laws, of course, so the way of reading that I propose is to say something like, nothing will happen which does not meet this equality, right? So this is ruling something out in the sense of ruling out anything that doesn't follow this curve. I think it's Boyle's law. Um, so it probably strikes you immediately that this is both ruling things out and ruling things in, right? You can say, well, anything that's on that line is ruled in. And that's going to be the case. So uh, an equation, if it's a simple deterministic linear equation, it's going to do both jobs pretty well, right? Because there's only one set of things that are possible, there's things that are on that curve. So it says nothing that's not on this curve and anything that is on this curve are possible. Yeah, so it's doing, uh, Boyle's law is doing both the job of a law and a model at the same time. Uh, and it might be that we built up our conception of laws on simple linear laws like this, and so we were satisfied with the idea that they say what does happen. Um, but when you get into anything but simple linear laws, so just for note, I have no idea what any of this means. I do know, however, that these are Navier-Stokes equations from fluid dynamics. Um, so in fluid dynamics, the laws are incredibly well worked out. These are they're derived basically from like Newtonian mechanics, really nice proofs of all this stuff. So the, the, the laws are very well established, but it's torturously difficult to extract predictions from these things. Solving these analytically is possible as far as we know. Modeling them, you can use big numerical simulations, but that's really your best bet. So extracting positive predictions. So in the, in the example I just showed you, extracting positive predictions from this negative claim, nothing but what's on this curve, is really easy. You just, yeah, okay, something's on that curve, so it's possible. Here, I propose to read this in the exact same way. Nothing that fails to satisfy these equations will happen in a fluid dynamical system. Great, so what does happen? Oh, that's a, uh, hmm, we're gonna have to wait till computers are invented to actually work that out. Uh, because it's really, really hard to get a positive prediction out of complex series of nonlinear differential equations. It's not impossible, but it's a gap, right? There's a big gap between knowing the law and knowing what's actually going to happen in a system. This is, this is the big problem of climate science and fluid dynamics more generally. So, so there's, a, there's some laws that do both the law job and the model job, and there's some laws that are just laws, and there's some laws where it's really hard to get the models, right? So you have the law, but developing the model is just, it's a second task from developing the law. Uh, there's another class of laws that I think my, my account handles really nicely that philosophers have had some trouble with, which is zero force laws. So Newton's first law, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, those are zero force laws. And explicitly what they say is, here's what happens when there's no forces acting on the system. And if you think laws tell you what's going to happen, that's mysterious for you. Because there's no systems experiencing no forces. Yeah? So uh, Newton's first law says an object which is experiencing no forces will not accelerate. But every object is experiencing at least gravitational attraction. So it doesn't apply to anything. So Newton, you might not have bothered with the first law. That was fine. We, you did well, but maybe just we didn't need that one. That's a really weird interpretation, right? So nobody likes that interpretation. Here's an interpretation which makes this actually say something quite positive about all systems. So here's what never happens. An object accelerates randomly without experiencing any forces. Uh, at the quantum level, maybe, but if we're talking about the, size, the world of medium-sized, slow-moving dry goods, it's just never the case that a cup just goes pew for no reason. There's always a force. So it says something quite positive ab about every object in the universe, but it says what never happens to them, not what does happen to them. Right? I'm sure there were forces acting on those leaves when they fell. Okay. 
So, uh, right, so zero force laws, they're a bit mysterious, they're a bit confusing if you think laws tell you what's gonna happen, but they make perfect sense if you understand them as telling you what never happens. Objects never randomly accelerate without forces acting on them. And that's true of everything, not true of nothing. So, that's nice. Um, I just wanna point out one difference between the universal generalization account and this account. I think my account is much easier to accommodate non-strict laws, so laws that admit ex exceptions. This is uh, scaling laws from biology, so this is mass and this is metabolic rate, and this rough scaling law applies from unicellular organ organisms to our size stuff to the largest animals. Neat, huh? The, there's a correlation between mass and metabolic rate across humongous differences in scale. It's cool, right? Um, but notice that, like, there's a little bit of, it's a little bit of wiggle room here, right? There's nothing, not everything is falling exactly and strictly on these lines. They had to draw a couple different lines to get all the data to fit. So it's not the case that this is a, it's not like the Pauli exclusion principle. The Pauli exclusion principle is never violated as far as we know. It just doesn't happen. Whereas scaling laws admit a little bit of wiggle room in their, in their application. And nonetheless, we think it's a good generalization. So this is a, clearly a generalization. I propose to read it as a generalization, not about what never happens, but about what generally never happens. So you can just sort of allow your notion of laws to be less strict but nonetheless give it, so we used to think of the laws are the things that are always true. Well, maybe we can recover a lot of our laws by saying, well, they're not, it's not that they're always true. It's just they have this distinctive role of ruling things out that we can allow to be either strict or less than perfectly strict. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about models. So models are odd. One of the things that philosophers worry about, about models is they seem to be tolerant of exceptions and kind of sloppy around the edges. Uh, so here's a, here's a classic model from Woodward. He pulled this out of a textbook on models. So you, know, you relate the amount of fertilizer, the amount of water, and the plant height, and then some error terms and some constants. But basically, you, know, you, you, you can tell, you can use this to model how tall your plant's going to grow given a certain amount of water and a certain amount of fertilizer. Now, that's probably a good model within its range, right? There's a certain range in which that gives you good predictions about what's gonna happen. But of course, you don't get plants that are 100 times taller by giving them 100 times more water or 100 times more fertilizer, right? So the, there's clear limits on how far this model will apply and a lot of other factors could be relevant that aren't mentioned in this model. This model is not plausibly read as saying, here's the only way that water, fertilizer, and plant height could be related. That's clearly false. Like if you let it, if it's the winter time, none of this applies. If you don't give it any light, none of this applies. Like, so there's all kinds of other things that could be relevant. All this law is saying, or sorry, all this model is saying is, here's one way that these variables could be related. Here's a possible way that they could relate. And I think I just said all of that. Uh, so that's, I think that's generally how, how models work. What they're trying to do is just give you a slice of a space of possibilities and say, here's some things that are possible in this domain. You know, it's fuzzy around the edges, it admits of exceptions, but that's, if all you're trying to do is give some of the possibilities, that's enough. Uh, now consider other types of models. Model students, wouldn't you all like Hermione in one of your classes? She is the model student, as far as I can tell. So I think roughly the same story applies to non-mathematical uses of model. A model student who got 95% on their test shows that it was possible to get 95%. Right? It doesn't mean that it's generally gonna be true that students will get that. It's not a predictive thing for the whole space. All the model student shows is that, yeah, it, you could have gotten, it wasn't impossible for you to have gotten an A plus on this test. Hermione did it. Uh, a model organism can show that it's possible to, for example, extend the life of a, of a mammal by 50% by doing a certain intervention. Does that mean that it's going to generalize? Definitely does not mean that but it shows that it's possible, right? This, so there is in the space of possible things that can happen to a mammal, some life extending interventions in this area warrants further research. Those are the kind of inferences that you make from animal models. Really what these models are doing is illuminating some limited part of a domain of possibilities. That's my suggestion. Okay, so 
laws rule things out, models rule things in. Uh, so how does this relate to explanations? So uh, I want to claim that our explanations also require us to do two things, uh, which are related to the jobs of laws and models. That is, they rule out contrast classes and they apply widely. So ruling out contrast classes, this is an example from Van Frossen. So here's three explanatory requests of the exact same event. Why did Adam eat the apple? Why did Adam eat the apple? Why did Adam eat the apple? And those three requests ask us to rule out three different contrast classes. So why did Adam rather than somebody else eat the apple? Why did Adam eat the apple rather than throwing it or carving something clever into it? And why did Adam eat the apple rather than any of the other things that he could have eaten? So those are the contrast classes and these explanatory requests, you know, just by shifting the emphasis, you shift the contrast class, but to give an explanation for any of these things is to rule out other possible members of the contrast class, right? So why did this happen rather than that? Well, a good explanation gives you some means of ruling out contrast classes. Fairly standard thought in the explanation literature. But here's another thing. So some people who talk about explanation think that's pretty much all explanations do is they rule out contrast classes. But I think there's something more. I think there's a kind of positive job that explanations can do as well. That is, they can export widely. So instead, they don't just rule things out. They tell us what could also be ruled in. So here's an explanatory request. Why did you order the pasta instead of the steak? And here's a one answer, because I don't eat steak. Rules out the contrast class, doesn't it? It was explicitly requested, so here's my contrast class, the steak. Ruled it out, I don't need steak. It's, a, it's an explanation of sorts. Here's a better explanation, because I'm a vegetarian. Yeah? So also rules out the contrast class, but it gives you further information. It gives you information that you could apply. If you happen to get yourself a second date, you might be able to tell why they would take the risotto rather than the chicken, right? Whereas the first explanation just tells you about steak. Right, so both do an equally good job of ruling out the contrast class, but one of them gives you the power to export to new cases in a way that the other one doesn't do as well. So not just ruling out contrast classes, but ruling in other possibilities in the domain, or at least exporting to other possibilities in the domain. So those are roughly two different things that I think you want from explanation. Those are, I won't tire you with the, the references, but those are fairly, both fairly common thoughts in the explanation literature, and I'm just kind of mashing them together. Uh, so in some cases, you might care more about one of those than the other. Uh, maybe ruling out a single contrast is enough, given your goals. Uh, I think historians do this sometimes. They just want to know why one specific thing that didn't happen didn't happen. They don't need a nice general explanation. They just want to say, well, why didn't this happen? And having, ex having ruled out that one contrast, that's good. Uh, scientists generally want the kind of explanations that both rule out contrasts and export widely. So we want to know not just why did this specific thing happen, but what are other similar circumstances in which it could have happened. And if you can do both, you're in a really great position because you know your, I would say, in the, as a recipient of a great explanation, we know our way around a domain of possibilities a bit better. So that's what happens to you when you get a good explanation is that you know about what's possible and impossible in a domain or likely or unlikely in a domain. So, uh, right. so in sum, here's a coloring book metaphor. My proposal is that laws roughly draw the outlines of a domain of possibilities and then models shade in the middle ground. Right? They fill in the, 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 the law tells you here are the limits of this domain and the model tells you here is the content of that domain. And to have a scientific explanation, a really good scientific explanation, is to have a little bit of both of those things. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Thank you.